Hello, everyone. I am Alderman Will Stewart, and I'm here today with Al Aldenberg, Chief of the Manchester Police Department. And today we're going to be talking about current law enforcement challenges here in the city and how the Manchester Police Department is responding. Welcome, Chief. Good morning. Appreciate you having me, Alderman. Glad of course. Yeah, no, we're glad to have you here. And uh, um, let's jump right in, if you don't mind, um, yeah. with a uh, pretty pretty weighty topic, and that is um, gun violence and shootings. They, you know, kind of seem to be on the rise uh, here in the city and you know across the across the country, really. And I'm wondering, is, is this the case? And can you give us some perspective on this troubling trend? No, it's definitely a troubling trend that um, I fully recognized when I became the chief two years ago. That's exactly why I made it one of my one of my top priorities, uh, like, you know, as you know, and I put out four priorities and gun violence, um, reduction in gun violence was um, right at the top. So again, when we investigate gun violence or we look at gun violence, we want to make sure that we're, um, that our enforcement is, is on the right people and that we're just not um, randomly going out enforcing or targeting people inappropriately um, just because we feel that they may be involved in gun violence. You know, so we took a deep dive into the, you know, the social network analysis. Um, and what we found was that, as we suspected, that um, there's a small population here in the city um, that's committing and responsible for um, a large amount of the gun violence. Um, so those are the people that our enforcement efforts are focused on. Um, we've had a lot of success. Um, you know, so far this year, I think we're up around... Um, pushing about 80 to 85 to 90 guns that were taken off the streets that are in the hands of prohibited people. Um, so they're convicted felons or they're possessing firearms in conjunction with drugs. Um, so those things are obviously a, always a bad recipe. So it is a constant problem that we have to uh, daily um, that I get briefed on. Uh, and also what we did with along with that lines is uh, every two weeks I hold the gun violence, um, gun violence meeting uh, intelligence and operation meetings where we bring together not just Manchester police folks, but I bring in county attorney, U.S. attorney, federal probation parole, state probation parole, juvenile, um, juvenile folks from the state, um, you name it. Uh, any all federal law enforcement office partners are invited. Surrounding communities are invited um, because a lot of this violence is spilling out into Hooksit, Londonderry, Bedford. Um, Nobody's immune to this problem, right? We just have a, a larger population. So what we do in those meetings is really focusing on, okay, we've had these gun fire incidents. Um, what are we doing about it? Who are the, the individuals been identified? Are there open cases somewhere else? Can we leverage probation parole? Um, can we leverage the county attorney's office, the U.S. attorney's office to, uh, or the AG's office? Um, are there open charges? Are they on probation, parole? Um, are they out on bail? So getting everybody to communicate so we're all just kind of heading in the right direction. Um, and, you know, and doing a lot with the technology, um, you know, the shot spotter, the fuses integration stuff that, that the board approved. Um, we got a lot going on to tackle this problem. Um, but is it going to go away? No, it's never always, it's never going to go away. We're a big city by New Hampshire standards. So you're going to have these big city problems. Um, but we do have a responsibility to uh, stay on top of it every day. Absolutely. And, you know, glad to hear about the, um, you know, all of those, you know, guns that were taken off the street in the past 12 months and, uh, you know, the the people who are wielding them, you know, being taken off the streets as well. And certainly um, interested and curious, you know, how the shot spotter, uh, which correct me if I'm wrong, this is where you're able to kind of triangulate, you know, where correct. shots are coming from so that you can, you know, address those in a more timely manner, correct? Right, in a more timely manner, um, get to the scene quicker, maybe save lives. Um, if we'd come across a shooting victim that we wouldn't have a kind of an exact location on, or at least within a few meters, we'll have that now, hopefully. Um, like I said, collect evidence quicker, um, narrow down the scope of where we're looking for a crime scene. Um, but normally, sometimes, you know, we'll get a 911 call four to five minutes after the, the gunfire happened. That's an eternity. Um, right. We'll also track, you know, we'll be able to tell if it's a, a drive-by shooting, if you will, as we see the rounds happening, going in a certain direction, that's going to help responding officers and hope it could save their lives as well. Um, so they truly know what they're going into. So. No, that's great to have that kind of intelligence. And you're right, seconds uh, do matter in situations like this. Certainly do. 
Um, you know, another big topic, uh, certainly one uh, that was a big topic Tuesday night at City Hall is mm -hmm. homelessness. And, yes. you know, while, while being homeless is not a crime, I know the police department is certainly involved in addressing homelessness related issues here in the city. Um, yeah. I'm wondering what you can tell us about the police department's work in this space and, and what can and can't be done to address the issue from a law enforcement perspective. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, we, it, it's an ugly problem. Um, it's a difficult problem. As you know, it's a complex problem. Um, I've said it publicly, you know, we're not going to rest our way out of it. Does the police department have a role in this homeless issue? 100%. Um, that's why we're out there every day. Um, my community affairs division, my officers are down there. Um, probably 95% of their shift is over in that area of 199 Manchester and Manchester and Pine, um, which is disheartening. It's discouraging, right? But if we don't do it, um, it's going to get worse. So are we we taking enforcement down there on criminal behavior? Yes. Um, as I mentioned the other night, just in the month of December alone, 21 arrests were made out of there for a variety of things from warrants to assaults um, to drug possession. And then daily, we're probably issuing anywhere from 10 to 15 city ordinance violations for drinking in public, public urination, public defecation, you know, conduct in public places, um, that goes quality of life issues. Um, and I know that people are frustrated, rightfully so. In addition to that, um, those officers that are over there um, are engaging with the business owners. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I understand that the daycare is closing, but we had many conversations with them. I put officers over at the daycare um, during the day, kind of during drop off and pick up. That kind of seemed to alleviate mm -hmm. some of the issues. Um, we're also engaging with all the businesses over there on a daily basis. And my area officers are over there. Um, having those conversations with the business owners. Um, so we are, you know, I do, I'll be honest with you, I, I take exception when sometimes the narrative is that the police department's not doing anything about it. Um, it's just not it's not fair to our officers. It's not accurate. Um, right. Fire department's doing a lot. Uh, outreach is doing a lot. And I really think that, you know, our new homeless um, coordinator, you know, we've got to give her an opportunity. You know, been here only three weeks. Um, right. And... I know that, okay, a lot of different interpretations of the law are out there. And, you know, I think I have a responsibility to follow the advice of the city solicitor because um, we both are in positions where we have to protect the city as well and the taxpayers. Um, so we're mindful of that. Um, but to, I think, to take the stance to um, just move them and push them, um, I don't think it's going to help. I really don't. And I think that. If we do that, they're going to end up in another part of the city. Um, you know, they're going to then I'm going to be over dealing with that part of the city. Um, they're already this isn't our only homeless population, right? There's many that are living out in the woods, kind of off the grid, um, that we engage with as well. Um, so yeah, it's um it's frustrating, um, and we try to balance you know enforcement with at the end of the day they they are human beings um, that yes substance abuse mental health. And it's all part of it. And I get the business community, like, not that they don't care. I think they do are sensitive to that, but they've had enough. Um, so we're going to keep working every day to come up with a solution. But well, like I said, we're not going to rest our way out of it. We're not. No. And like you said, it's, it's complex uh, yeah. on, you know, so many different levels and there are, um, you know, balance, I think was the uh, a word that you used there. And uh, you know, balancing of rights and responsibilities, and uh, certainly not easy. But uh, you know, you know, I do appreciate everything you know you and your officers are doing. You know, on the front and the uh, the incredibly difficult and challenging job that you have in addressing you know this issues among all the other issues that uh, that take place right. across the city. Having a whole, whole other city, we got a police too. Correct. Yeah. Um, so, kind of you know, on those lines, you know, whether it's gun violence, you know, homelessness. Um, you know, any type of, um, you know, law enforcement responsibility, you know, policing, I think, is, is often thought of as a kind of a reactive, you know, response mm -hmm. to crime, i.e. a crime is committed, you know, then the police are called to investigate, you know, make an arrest. Um, and I'm wondering, however, if you might be able to talk a little bit about, you know, what the police department does to help prevent crime from occurring in the first place. What proactive crime prevention measures uh, does the Manchester Police Department undertake? Yeah, no, we, um, you're right about the reactive. Um, we do try to balance the officers with their reactive and proactive time, um, the patrol officers. It's hard for the patrol officer going from call to call to get engaged in that 
kind of proactive activity, um, but they do when they can. Um, and along the lines of, um, you know, we're trying to get some, get the officers back to some of the basics, um, you know, motor vehicle enforcement. I hear a lot about that. Um, you know, speeders here, speeders there. Um, I got a lot of young officers. And it's not about doing motor vehicle enforcement and issuing summonses and tickets. It's more about the contacts. It's a positive interaction. Hey, can you slow down? Here's a warning. Um, but above and beyond that, you know, um, through the community policing affairs um, division, when they have time, when they're not dealing with homeless, um, they're doing outreach to businesses um, through the um, SEPTED program. That's a really big thing I think we should highlight is the uh, crime prevention through environmental design. Mm -hmm. um, and we've done a lot of that. Uh, Rich L through the, um, through the money we got through ARPA to dedicate um, to that crime prevention through environmental um, actions. We've worked with uh, the churches, we've worked with the schools, businesses, and we get several requests now. Uh, Rich L is kind of running ragged now. He's getting many calls from businesses because the word's getting out there. And we're going out and doing those assessments on, say, a business, a church, mm -hmm. um, a private organization, whatever it may be. Hey, what can I do around my property that could you know, maybe deter somebody from committing a crime. You know, is that increased lighting? Is that um, fixing fencing? Is that removing, you know, dead trees or cleaning up the property? Um, so that's what you mean by environmental design, those types exactly. of actions. Yeah, it's, the old, it's really the broken windows theory, mm -hmm. you know, and encouraging property owners to kind of take some ownership at their level and what they can do on their own property to, you know, deter somebody from committing a crime at their location or in and around their property. Um, so we're doing a lot along those lines. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I remember, you know, back in, you know, late 2021, I believe it was, um, you know, we were talking about, and I know you'd mentioned to the board that the police department had increased from eight hours to 40 hours a year. Mm -hmm. You know, training on topics like implicit bias, cultural responsiveness, conflict de-escalation, you know, yep. using non-lethal force. You know, now that we're, you know, more than a year away from that, I'm curious to hear more about how this training has been, you know, deployed and received and, and what, if any, changes have been realized as a result. Um, it's been well received uh, with inside the PD. Uh, we also bring in outside instructors, um, especially with the, you know, implicit bias training, culture awareness, kind of bringing in uh, some outside instructors that give the officers a different perspective instead of hearing from another cop. Um, mm -hmm. So we've done, what we've kind of increased um, is a lot along the lines of um, tactical medicine, um, kind of me tact med, we call it, um, for the officers, uh, for their survival on the street should something happen. Um, a lot of scenario-based training. Uh, I also brought in a, um, a simulator that we have down in our range that puts officers through scenarios, kind of a, hey, what are you gonna do? And not every scenario is a shoot. Um, mm -hmm. hey, this, it's, it's resolved through verbal communication or it's resolved through some of the less lethal tactic. Um, so the training has been well received. You know, taking an officer or a detective out of their assignment and putting them in a training for a week keeps them focused. Okay, I'm here for a week. I'm focused on doing training and I really don't have to worry about anything else for a week. Um, so it's been very beneficial. I just met with the training staff last week and kind of, okay, how can we tweak 2023? Um, what do we need to change? You know, we're doing, we have a block on mental health and wellness for the officers. Um, mm -hmm. Also brought in a, um, we're going to do it again this year in 2023 as a um, financial advisor. Oh, okay. um, this, yep. She comes in and we did that last year for 2022 and that was really, really well received. We didn't know how it was going to go over. Um, she's a woman, volunteered her time. Um, she comes in for free and she's making appointments with officers and they're taking it serious about their, their future financial status. Um, so the younger cops are paying attention. You know, things that I didn't get when I came on. Um, right. Yeah, we're, um, we're definitely exceeding the training standard. Um, and the, you know, the training is definitely very engaging. That's great to hear. And um, as well as again, um, we also do legal updates too. But another thing we, we build on every year um, what law changes um, so that we're keeping them as updated as we can on what's going on. 
No, that's great. You know, I think you know every profession certainly needs that uh, you know training to to remain you know up to date on you know what's going on and how to better do their jobs. And you know, law enforcement, I, I would say you know more than most, given the uh, you know the power and authority you know that uh, that officers have, and you, know, you people who carry a gun you know need to be trained uh, you know sure very do. carefully. Sure um, do. With regard to, uh, I know some of these, some of the training that we've talked about, you know, the implicit bias and cultural awareness, um, you are know, really kind of in that, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, mm -hmm. kind of realm. Um, yeah. On that, on along those lines, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about what the Manchester Police Department is doing to recruit and retain officers of color as as well as women on the force. Yeah, well, a lot in regards to female officers, um, early on becoming chief, we adopted that thirty by thirty program. Um, it's a national program where the intent is by 2030 that we increase um, female officers in academies by 30%. Um, so I can tell you that when I started here in 20 in 2003, I have to come from somewhere else. Um, you could probably count the number of female officers on one hand. Um, hmm. For now, I don't have it in front of me, but I bet you I'm probably right around 30 female okay. officers. Uh, and it's spread out throughout the department. Where we need to get better in regards to the female officers, and we are, we have them in divisions and many specialized assignments from the drug unit to juvenile to detectives um, to community policing. We need to progress their careers in terms of promotions, right? Not just because they're a female, right? But, hey, they're a very good police officer. They're educated, they're qualified, and hey, they're a female, right? We need to really take the stance that Hey, someday there could be a female chief of police in the city of Manchester. It's never happened, right? Or, or a minority, you know, or you know, a person of color. Um, in terms of recruiting, um, you know, people of color, or it's definitely a challenge. Um, and we've we've spoken with our community advisory board. We've had those recruiting discussions. We meet with them on a monthly basis. We kind of pick a topic. We brought up the recruiting. Um, I've added a person to my recruiting unit to kind of, because um, it's hard hiring people right now. It's extremely difficult. Yeah. I got, as of this morning, I have 15 vacancies. Um, 15? 15. Okay. When I took over, we were right around 25. Um, the lowest I've got it is 11. So, you know, you balance retirements. So we are trying to, you know, how are we going to have this police department you know, have people working here that, to the best of our ability, represent the community that we're we're serving. Right. Um, so yeah, do I have um, do I have black officers, Hispanic officers, Asian officers? Yes. Um, do we need to increase that? Yes. So the recruiting division is they understand that um, in trying to go after those populations as best as we can. We are getting close to working with info systems to stand up our own standalone recruiting website. Um, hmm. That's something with this agency has, ne has never had. Um, so the training, the recruiting guys came and said, hey, Chief, I think we need our own website. Strictly separate from the police departments or the city's website. So working with HR and info, we want to do the standalone recruiting website. Because um, that's where it's at, right? It's not, you know, the, the young men and women of today, they don't really go to, you know, they don't go to a paper to look for a job or they don't go right. perhaps to HR's website, right? It's, you're going to get them through um, Instagram. You're going to get them through Twitter. You're going to get them through Facebook. Um, we haven't gone as far as Snapchat yet, but um, we're going to get them through YouTube. So that's some TikTok videos there, Chief. I'm, I'm going to stay away from that. Um, <laughs> there is a place for TikTok videos, I think, for law enforcement, um, yep. if done appropriately. Okay. Sure. I've learned from other PDs where it's was not done appropriately. So again, balance in all things, right? Exactly. Yep. yep. That so, we do recognize as an issue, though. It's definitely an issue. No, yeah. for sure. And uh, appreciate you know the department's uh, you know recognition of this and you know efforts to uh, yeah if I, right, better reflect. If I could. Better. And one thing I'm doing today at twelve o'clock, I'm meeting with the um, clergy association of Manchester, um, over at uh, on Union Street. They invited me, so. It, I'm already thinking like, okay, there's an opportunity, right? There's an opportunity for recruiting and kind of break down some barriers and, hey, maybe we should, 
you know, maybe I should have my son or daughter think about going in his profession because I met the chief and he seems seems like a decent human being or, you know what I mean? And that's how it's going to happen. You know? Yeah. And I think, you know, breaking down those barriers and having those communication channels, you know, whatever they are and, you know, to meet people where they are. And, right. you know, I think that, you know, law enforcement, you know, sometimes, you know, can be seen as, as other and, um, you know, mm -hmm. where you're right. I mean, you're a human being, everybody's a human being. And, right. but sometimes it can, you know, seem a little bit, uh, you know, well, there's us and there's them. And uh, breaking down those barriers is a good thing. Yep, I don't want that. So, uh, Chief, in closing, I'm wondering if you have any asks of the viewers of this video or the public in general. What can you know Manchester residents do to help you and your officers? I would say, well, I I firmly believe, Alderman, that the vast majority of the citizens of the city support the police department. I really do. <clears throat> I I like to believe that. Um, because I have a lot of interactions with people and I ask for the continued support. Um, I would ask that people, um, you know, continue to take ownership where they can, uh, you know, in their own lives. And because the police aren't going to, you know, solve every problem that you have in your life um, and do little things around your home, you know, um, you know, walk your home when you leave for the day, you know, um, walk your cars at night. If you have guns in your car, um, and you can't bring it into the home, or at least lock, and you're locking it in your vehicle, have it in some type of safe in the vehicle that may be secured. Because um, the theft of guns from vehicles right now is um, is very alarming. We put out something not too long ago about that. Um, and the majority of those guns are ending up in the wrong hands, and they're ending up um, you know, committing violence. Um, I would just ask for the continued support. Um, and if Really, that that means the world to my police officers um, when they know that um, you know they do have the support of the public, and in return, we have to continue to earn that um, that trust and that respect. And I fully recognize that we are not a perfect police department, um, but I don't think it's I don't think there's a perfect police department in America. Um, and if they think they are, then they're probably fooling themselves. So, yeah. you know, we'll strive to get better every day. Well, I don't think there's a perfect institution of any variety, you know. Probably a better way. way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. We're all, you know, we're all human. And uh, yeah. you know, certainly comes with flaws and mistakes, uh and, you know, frequently happening. Um, I appreciate your advice too on um, you know, having people to, you know, be a little bit more, you know, careful around their own homes and you know, locking doors. It reminds me of an old, you know, sign I saw in a church one time. It said, you know, trust in the Lord, but lock your car. Um <laughs> Pretty good advice, I think. Yeah, that is um, good advice. Well, Chief Al Aldenberg, thank you for uh, for joining us here today to talk about these you know, very important issues. And uh, you certainly, um, you and your officers, you know, have my support. And uh, I believe you're right. Yes, the uh, you know most people in Manchester are uh, are with you as well. So thank you I for joining that. us, and uh, best of luck doing all. Thank you. Do. Thank you, Alderman.